Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Art Forum. My name's David Sequera, and I'm the director of the Margaret Lawrence Gallery, and I'm also the coordinator of Art Forum. And I want to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which uh, you are located right now. Uh, for most of us, this is in South Central Victoria, which is cool and nation. And I ask you to, in, to join me in acknowledging that the work of artists through song, dance, painting, ritual, took place on this very site for many, many generations before us. And that these art practices were intimately linked with healing, with ideas of land management and sustenance, welfare, law and language. And join me in paying respect to elders past, present and emerging. Our speaker today, James Lynch. Through his drawings, paintings and animation works, James Lynch explores connections between social relations, work, everyday life and the unconscious. His work has been exhibited widely across Australia and internationally. Group, group exhibitions include Red, Green, Blue, A History of Australian Video Art, Lurid Beauty, Australian Surrealism and Its Echoes, uh, it, Reinventing the Wheel, The Ready-Made Century, and I Walk the Line, New Australian Drawings. James is also currently curator at Deakin University, and his projects there include Drawing on the Wall, Studio Pottery, Echo Chambers, Art and Endless Reflection, and Unproductive Thinking. His first solo, in, the first solo show in several years is currently on show at Neon Park Gallery. Wherever you are, please make James welcome. Thank you. Thank you, David, for that lovely introduction. I'll um, just share my first. I'd like to have begin the um, formal proceedings by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. And I also acknowledge any First Nations artists and audience members, audience members listening to, today, to today's uh, Zoom presentation. I'm an artist and curator at the Deakin University Art Gallery, which is in uh, Burwood at the Burwood campus. Uh, Burwood is, um, you know, a, not an easy suburb to get to. Our campus, um, you can take the tram or two types of public transport to get here, to get to Burwood. Um, so our gallery is um, about the similar size to the Margaret Lawrence Gallery. We also have a gallery at Deakin Downtown, um, which is in Melbourne's Docklands. Um, we do lots of great shows there, one of which um, here, for example, is John Nixon's Studio Pottery Collection, which was um, the last show of 2018. And, um, last, just recently over summer was um, expanded and um, in a larger exhibition called Collector Collected at the Shepparton Art Museum. And so I'm in Reservoir, um, a northern suburb of Melbourne. Um, here's a picture of our front garden. I'm on the right here in this little window. Um, looking out, um, I've buried myself into um, our bedroom. Um, I'm sharing our lockdown with um, myself, my partner, Nadine Christensen, who you may um, already know, of course, and um, our three children, Hunter, Surgeon, Leo. Um, I actually grew up in Reservoir, which is um, a weird twist of fate. Um, here's a photo of me, I think, from the early 80s with my sister Bernadine and um, our pet dog, John, um, who was um, very untrained. Um, and yeah, when we were um, looking at um, buying a house, Reservoir was the first affordable suburb um, heading north. 
And um, I, we also wanted to be closer to our family. So ended up here 10 years ago. Um, yeah, it's day 40 since the primary schools um, uh, were closed early before at the end of term one. Um, and this is a photo of our post-it notes on our fridge. Um, yeah, so on the 24th of March, yeah, was the last day of school. And the day after that, Wednesday, the 25th of March, was the day I installed my exhibition at Neon Park Gallery. Uh, here's a photo of us in lockdown having some muscles last week. And yeah, so as COVID-19 was um, developing, you know, um, I had this exhibition um, at Neon Park scheduled to um, happen. The exhibition was actually scheduled for the end of last year, but um, I wasn't quite ready. And then we postponed it to the early this year and um, had been working on it over summer. Um, and um, as COVID was developing, you know, the week before um, the exhibition was due to open, Jeff and I decided, you know, we won't do an opening event. You know, we couldn't have large groups of people. Um, but as I was setting up the exhibition on that Wednesday, you know, it dawned on both Jeff and I that really the exhibition wouldn't open to the public, that um, he would, um, if he could, have people in by appointment only, um, one at a time. So the exhibition really was kind of closed um, before it really even opened, um, which was hugely disappointing. And I think partly my invitation to talk to you guys today um, from David Sequeira was a little bit out of sympathy, but I was um, very delighted to be able to um, have a forum and an audience for this exhibition um, over this Zoom presentation. Um, yeah, I'm going to hopefully talk um, for about another 25 minutes and then have plenty of time for um, questions and answers. I wanted to talk a bit about this show, but also a bit about the past, um, touch on some early works and also um, some of my, the more major projects and also introduce kind of um, the time when I was at art school. I think it's really challenging to kind of um, uh, talk about yourself without being biographical. Um, I haven't done an artist talk in a really long time. Um, so I forgive, um, please forgive me if I'm um, making lots of errors, but um, I haven't been teaching for a long time as well. So um, I'm a little bit rusty, but also I think it's hard to kind of not talk about history and to kind of separate yourself from it. Um, I think we're all uh, children of our times, of course, but also I think it's the job of the artist to, um, to represent their moment and their place in history. So um, I wanted to talk about when I went to art school, just briefly as a way of introduction, um, I, grew, I finished year 12 in Preston in 1992 and in 1993 I went and studied um, a Bachelor of Visual Arts at Monash University Gippsland campus, GCAD. Um, I did a kind of foundation year there with some great artists like Ewan Hang, Susan Purdy, um, Chris Coventry, uh, Julie Adams. Um, but halfway through that, I kind of dropped out and applied again um, my second time to get into the Victorian College of the Arts. Um, so I started um, my, what was the Bachelor of Fine Art painting um, at the Victorian College of the Arts in 1994. I put up an image of the gas and fuel buildings because, um, you know, I used to catch the train into university to VCA, walk down St Kilda Road. The gas and fuel buildings loomed large and they were kind of symbolic. Um, by the time I'd finished, I finished in 1996 and they were kind of demolished um, right throughout 
that last year. And the buildings were really symbolic of that brutalist modernist movement, um, but more so um, just a, a symbolic of um, kind of a period and chapter of uh, Melbourne's modern history kind of coming to an end. Um, art school for me was an incredible experience. Um, I was such an eager, um, desperately wanting to please kind of student who worked kind of very hard and studied really hard. Um, and um, so, yeah, I arrived at art school in 1994. It was the first, I think maybe the first year or the second year VCA merged with the National Gallery School. And I think it might've been the first or the second year that we moved into um, the current premises in the kind of stables and old and buildings um, and the painting where the painting department is now. Um, 1994 was the first year of or second year of HEX. So we had to start paying for our, but um, there was our study. So um, there was financial support for students, um, which allowed me to go to art school. Um, it was the year of Kurt Cobain's suicide, of course. For me, the Melbourne Underground Dance Movement was really important. And all moreover, it was the beginning of the recession. And I um, have put that there um, as a speaking kind of note. Um, it was a great time of revision. Uh, you know, paintings like Peter Booth's work was... Um, uh, you know, a hugely popular and successful throughout the 80s. Uh, this iconic painting from 1997 was collected in the 80s by the NGV. And um, this was the kind of painting that had preceded um, uh, the early 90s. Um, huge painting, um, the huge painting movement, like some of Juan de Villa's huge works, that period was over. Um, the lecturers at the time all discussed that the boom times were over and that it was a different kind of historical moment. Um, 1994, 95, 96, yeah, it was a great time. A lot of things were being revised, rethought about. There was a new kind of critical look at um, the past postmodernism was in. There was lots of new types of uh, artworks and uh, mediums emerging. Installation practice, you know, was really just kind of kicking in. Um, here's a fantastic example from um, Lauren Berkowitz, of course, um, at Karen Lovegroves. And um, video was just emerging as well. Douglas Gordon's 24-hour psycho was hugely um, influential. So these new forms of art were emerging, as well as, you know, the postmodern um, critical thinking was really um, a huge part of art school at the time. I've put art theory in huge big letters because when I was at art school, people kind of talked about it in kind of whispered tones. Um, have you read art theory was kind of hushed under our breath. Um, everybody wanted to kind of know what was art theory. I used to walk around kind of asking lecturers, you know, what is art theory? Where do I find it? Um, where do I get some? Like it was some kind of drug. Art theory was something that was talked about like that any lecturer could kind of like a baseball bat wield it at you and it would somehow make your practice kind of crumble and redundant. Of course, texts like October Magazine and Art and Text were the primary kind of ways that we were engaging with theory. But I think most of the artists at that time were trying to grapple with some of these greater philosophical and um, ideas that had come out of postmodernism, post-structuralism at that time. And we're all trying to kind of grapple in it with it in our in different ways. Um, I studied um, with um, artists such as Clinton Nainer, um, 
he was the only, uh, or they were the only um, Indigenous First Nations artists as part of my peer group at the VCA at that time. Clinton was actually in third year when I was in second year. Um, this is actually some snaps of my graduate um, graduate work, not the graduate exhibition, but my um, assessment um, presentation. I did lots of little paintings kind of based on maps um, and little constructions based on old maps and objects, uh, paintings based on um, nautical kind of flags and symbols. I had great lecturers that I really looked up to, Callum, Jeff Lowe, Melinda Harper was hugely influential, Ros Piggott, Rose Nolan. Some of my peers uh, that are prominent still now, Ebony Truscott's coming into her own, Ricky Swallow, Ben Armstrong, Sean Millack, Brad Westmoreland, Sharon Goodwin, Kylie Wilkinson, Narelle Desmond. But more so, um, I had um, a peer group who I was studying with at the time um, who were in third year, second year, while I was in first year. Um, Dave Rosetsky, Amanda Armhead, Linda Walker, Andrew McWalter, John Mead and Simone Sleeve. They kind of had started an artist run space called First Floor Artists and Writers Space. And they kind of achieved um, success almost instantly. And they kind of set up their own gallery, but also kind of created a lot of discourse around their work, which was hugely um, influential and successful, a lot of writing. And they connected with, um, you know, Melbourne University, critical thinking, film studies. And um, in doing so, they created a fantastic context for contemporary art. And it was hugely um, admirable um, that my colleagues who were still in undergrad were doing this. And it kind of emboldened me to be more, um, uh, to take greater risks and to have agency as a young artist. So one of the things that um, I took from third year, I think, was to kind of work in series. And I was really um, inspired by a lot of conceptual art to kind of work in series and to kind of think about meaning as located outside of individual objects, but in a kind of an approach or um, in a kind of uh, group of works in a kind of gestalt way. So, um, of course, the mid to late 90s was a huge period of artist-run spaces in Melbourne booming. There was hop, heaps of vacant spaces um, that artists took over for galleries, and that kind of has continued till now. Um, there was, of course, grey area which and first floor. Um, here's an example of um, Julia Gorman's exhibition at grey area. But um, at art school, of course, um, we formed DAMP, myself and uh, Sharon Goodwin, Narelle Desmond, Kylie Wilkinson, Daniel Noonan, a group of artists working together. This is a work that we made from 1998, which was a model of an audience for an exhibition. And, and we've been working in various guises ever since then. This is a work from, I think, 20, 2007, Untitled Plinth and a more recent work that we did for the incinerator uh, space um, called The White Lady. So we've been working together since then. Um, as I left art school, I kind of didn't make my own work for quite a while and um, I kind of forgot kind of the types of works I made at art school. I did a lot of stuff with video. And um, of course, I also had a little curatorial project with Ricky Swallow, Julia Gorman, Andrew McWalter called Rubik. We published a lot of artist books. Um, here they are. And um, we tried to have an artist run space that was more like a record label than um, a space without a space. That's how we called it. Um, here's an artist book, uh, artist page by David Jolly. And we had parties, exhibitions in different kind of spaces, non-gallery spaces. So as I began kind of in the art world, I was kind of already engaging with the art world in lots of different ways. And um, 
it took like 18 months before I I kind of had my first solo exhibition in inverted commas. So my early works, um, such as this one, Real Life is Everywhere, Neon Park just posted this on their Instagram account last week. So um, this was a series of hand-drawn little um, packaging objects, um, consumable items um, that I'd hand-drawn and uh, set up in the gallery as though it was a kind of um, spectacle event. Um, so these early works uh, I wanted to show kind of um, very broadly looked at how we bracket and overlay our everyday experiences to kind of make sense of the world. I was reading a lot of Irving Goffman and I wanted to think about how, yeah, we process everyday experiences, but also overlay a layer of artifice onto the everyday. So real life was everywhere. Real life is everywhere was really inspired by situationism. And it was um, Christopher Gray uh, was an American um, situationist that I really um, was inspired by. Um, this is an early work, I think, from the following year, 1999. Um, a photographic backdrop, really, um, in the group show at Gertrude Contemporary at that time, a painted kind of tableau with a graffiti that people could kind of look at, but it was really also something that people would pose in front of. Um, the same year, I had a show at first floor where I painted um, a sunrise or a sunset onto the window pane of um, the window glass of first floor. And that was um, like a work I'd never really made before. I'd done little paintings on canvas of sunsets and sunrises, but um, I just thought I'd have a go. And um, yeah, it was, you know, like a light box at night with the windows turned on in the gallery at you know, the, the gallery functioned as a light box. And during the day, it was more like a stained glass window. So that work was called A Place in the Sun. And I wanted to kind of give people what I thought they kind of wanted, which was their place in the sun. This work was called Abstract Setting. I think it was from 2000. So, um, yeah, I was kind of thinking about this frame of art, how we put it around certain things, but not around others. So I just kind of took the kind of um, the design from, you know, takeaway drink containers and put it onto a canvas. And then I kind of had this painted backdrop. So each of these objects, the backdrop, the canvas and the um, drink containers were all painted objects. But of course, at the opening, people stood on the drink cups so I kind of wanted to bring people's attentions to where the frame begins and ends. Um, this work, um, and um, it was um, for a show kind of specifically called uh, that a survey of painting that I was included in um, just down at Linden Art Gallery in St Kilda. I kind of didn't consider myself a painter, so I kind of made a work in response, which was a kind of, um, these were all hand-drawn um, newsprint and um, hand kind of made little containers, spray cans. And this was assembled on the floor as though someone had been there painting. But of course, the whole thing was a painted kind of artifice. And so I kind of, yeah, was inspired by Mal Bochner's great artwork theory of painting, a conceptual artist. And yeah, I think it was Raf Ishak that stood on this work at uh, Linden when it was first um, displayed. So this kind of took me up until around 2002, 2001, and I did lots of um, colored pencil drawings of just um, doorways, exits and entrances, um, street scenes fr from my kind of journey to and from the studio. And this work I saw as a kind of, um, a kind of animated sequence. And it kind of led to myself making um, animated works. So, 
kind of, yeah, from around 2002 up to around 2008, I um, did this project called Other People's Dreams in which I appeared. Um, in 2001, I um, went and had the Los Angeles studio. And so I was over in LA for about four months. Um, and before that, I'd, I'd been traveling quite a bit. And so having long distance relationships, but also previous to that, I'd been working um, a lot as a waiter. And I'm kind of just thinking about how um, you'd see someone on a tram in the morning and then that appear in your dream that night. Also, I kind of had been working in DAMP as a group for quite some time already by this point. And rather than having the question of what is it that we want collectively, the question kind of shifted for me to be, what is it that others want from me? So I collected um, a series of stories that people had told me, uh, recounting their dreams in which I had appeared. So um, especially living overseas, I had um, lots of stories from telephone conversations um, remembered um, from myself and my partner. Um, that um, I turned, I kind of collected for a while and then I kind of started using these narratives as the basis for um, artworks. I kind of wanted to think about um, our processes of, processes of identification and the kind of role of the individual, of course, within the group. Um, but also what is it our, you know, the, the, the role we have in the fantasy of others. And I think, you know, we have roles for each other, which are far greater than our jobs, of course. Um, and so I wanted to kind of explore this intricacy of the social fabric. And of course they were my view of the other's view of me. So they weren't just my view, nor they were just another's, but they were kind of a combination or an interweaving of, of stories. So that's a little painting um, from 2003, I think. Um, and yeah, the first showing of them was in a big show I did up at Mori Gallery before it had finished. And I kind of set up the space like a kind of cinema kind of set. Um, and had a lot of video works dotted around the walls. Um, yeah, I often kind of made installations for these animations kind of as sets, painted sets. Um, they weren't just animations too. I kind of wanted to explore this as a kind of meta project. So I made a lot of drawing, paintings, animations kind of relating to these narratives. And again, it was so the meaning of the works weren't just located in singular objects, but are kind of across different media and processes. So I did lots of rotoscoping and um, really simple attempts at animation. This is a, some works from 2003, based on a dream that Nadine had had, that we were stuck in the jungle together. And that was the show at Uplands. Um, in 2004, I was showing with a gallery in Paris and I did this big installation of based on this one dream um, that Lisa Radford had had, that she was running around town with a coffee pot in search of a cup. And so I made a bunch of paintings and installation and, um, and uh, actually three different animations that kind of formed this exhibition. Um, and in 2005, um, I built this kind of um, DIY outdoor kind of cinema to screen them on at ACCA in one of the new exhibitions. So I'm just going to share and quickly watch um, one video now.
Hopefully you can all see and hear this. So yeah, the, um, that work was one of about eight animations I made over um, several years. Um, and yeah, I wanted to explore the unconscious as a social space full of kind of um, identification, group transformation um, and lamination. Um, uh, as I was making those works, yeah, that kind of, um, for me, it was kind of a way of um, exploring the social fabric. Um, but they were often talked about as being surrealist, which was really not the point at all for me. So I kind of didn't um, keep progressing. I thought I'd come back to that work project in a way, but I kind of haven't, but I, I hope to one day, but um, so I kind of kept pushing. Um, I wanted to explore the unconscious as this social space. So I kind of did a whole bunch of other works um, around 2006, seven. 
These were animations based on people's earliest memories at um, Pika. And I did a bunch of paintings of kind of as cutouts um, based on people's earliest memories. So I was kind of thinking of this kind of um, point in our lives representing this earliest memory, representing the time before um, symbol, you know, things became represented. These were all based on earliest memories. Um, I did a bunch of kind of sculptures that were um, very basic kinetic um, light works um, using old washing machines as magic lanterns. Um, kind of animated sculptures. Um, this was a show in Tokyo at Tokyo Wonder Sight. Uh, an animation I did there, made there on residency called The Drunken Soldier. And in 2008, I did a project at, for the Tarawara Biennale that year, um, where I worked with the cleaner at the time, um, who was also the facilities manager, and we kind of um, filmed his kind of daily life at the museum, and I kind of turned that into an animation. So yeah, I kind of kept making paintings and animations. These were based on kind of significant events, these paintings in my own life, significant memories I held on to. And then the last bunch of paintings, serious paintings I made were based on stories, people's retellings of their favorite artworks. So without giving me the biographical details of artist title date, just a text based on the story of the work. And then I made kind of my own version based on the story. Um, this is a favorite painting. It's in uh, the Potter's collection uh, based on um, a story that um, Sam George passed on to me. But John Nixon went and made uh, a song based on that painting, which I was very proud of. Um, so these paintings were based on other people's stories and I kind of reimagined them in different ways. So that led up into my last show in 2013 um, at Neon Park. Um, and these were just really simple studies of tools and stuff in my studio. My work had become really complicated, so I kind of had to find easier ways to make work. Um, and with the arrival of our twins, you know, I had, um, you know, Nadine and I had kind of a large family to look after, and I started working full time um, in 2014, 2016. I was curator of the collection at MAMA uh, in different roles and a lecturer at Monash. And then since 2016, I've been working. Um, full-time as curator at Deakin University. So around 2011, 2012, my career kind of came to a, not a halt or an abrupt stop, but it really did slow down. And it wasn't just the fact that I was now a parent and now working full-time. It was also the fact that curatorial interest in my work waned a bit, as it naturally does occur. Um, you know, the curators that moved on to the next generation of artists as they should. Um, so opportunities for exhibitions also kind of waned. Also, um, you know, a gallery that I'd worked with for 10 years, Uplands closed all around the same time. So, um, yeah, so I kind of stopped making work really and focused on both family life and work life. Um, for me also, you know, for many years leading up to this, you know, like what a lot of emerging artists do, you know, you have a myriad of other jobs which sustain your art practice, um, whether it's a sessional lecturer or whether you're working in hospitality or whether you're working in exhibitions, exhibition technician or in museums, in education roles. You know, it's not surprising for an emerging artist to have two, three or four different jobs. And for myself, because I'd already done this for like almost two decades, 
I really never defined myself through work because I was a practicing artist. So, um, so where, as I became a curator at Deakin, I'd never really stopped thinking of myself as not an artist, even though I hadn't been making work. So here are some examples of some of the shows at Deakin. This is the Unproductive Thinking from 2017, a show um, I'm very proud of. Um, another exhibition called The Drawing Room. So some of my exhibitions have been very pedagogically focused, student focused and um, centered around art making. Um, and this was Echo Chambers from early last year about the mirror. And just this year, Drawing on the Wall, which was a show um, that students kind of realized. So I wanted to pose this question. For me, it was, if you stop making work, do you stop being an artist? And I don't know if um, I have the answer to that. Initially, you know, I never, um, I never, you know, defined myself through work. I always defined myself through my art practice. So even though I had lots of other jobs, I never stopped thinking of myself in a, as an artist. And that kind of translated also as curatorial work where I was working as a curator, but still had the mindset of an artist. But I also did encounter a bit of hostility, both from artists, collectors and curators when, um, you know, my professional practice slowed down. A lot of artists were disappointed in me because um, that I couldn't make a go of it. Also, they kind of considered myself as one of the good ones or something. And, you know, artists are always sacrificing so much in their everyday life. And then when one artist kind of stops sacrificing, it kind of calls into question their own choices. Also, collectors were skeptical that, you know, their investment in my works were no longer of value because I wasn't, you know, champing at the bit to be continued to be an artist or curators were skeptical because I hadn't progressed through the usual channels of becoming a curator. So gradually over these last few years, 2015, 2016, 2017, not so much 2018, but 2019 and this year, I've kind of just been grabbing spare moments here and there. Um, sick days or little days here and there um, that I would have in the studio to kind of make work. Really simple, going back to basic kind of studies, just watercolor, pencil, acrylic works on paper. Um, just gonna show you some today. These aren't actually in the show at Neon Park, um, but there's about 50 or 60 of them. Um, and um, really just works that can be executed in a day um, and kind of just attempts at remembering, you know, who I am or was as an artist and ruminating on the various roles that I have as both a person, a father, a partner, as a museum professional and a curator and artist. So they're really just simple studies. Um, and the show at Neon Park uh, features 14 of these works, um, plus two new sculptures. Um, so this is, yeah, the installation at Neon Park. Um, And yeah, so I've made two new sculptures on top of the, the drawing works. Um, one of which is this oversized toothbrush. That work is called Dad. And the second work um, is a toolbox. Um, my own father, you know, uh, he passed away when I was very young, so I didn't really know him. So in my own life, it's just a bit of an unknown. And, um, but he did used to go down to an industrial part of reservoir and collect old scraps of wood and make um, kind of jerry built furniture. So I kind of um, made this toolbox with found bits of wood from Radford Road, 
um, where he used to collect stuff. And the toothbrush, yeah, when he did pass away, I didn't have really anything of him except his green toothbrush. So, um, so I was kind of thinking about how everyday objects just sometimes get all these extra meanings chucked onto them. Um, they become fetish objects, but also, you know, objects can become relics and ruins. Um, so the toothbrush for me was a symbol of, um, you know, like a relic of how something every day can be um, imbued with all this extra meaning. So that's um, where I've left the PowerPoint. Um, if I can throw it back to David or Nick, if anyone wanted to have any questions, we've probably got some time for now. We do indeed. Um, James, firstly, before we go to questions, I do want to take a moment to, um, you know, speak for everybody on this Zoom session and just thank you for your generosity and taking us through all of those parts of your life and, and weaving all of those aspects of your practice together and um you know taking us into the dining room and <laughs> spaghetti with the you know with the kids and nadine we really appreciate your generosity there we've got time for a couple of questions and i'm gonna hand over to nick to manage that for me please yep so we've got a question from uh, peter beck i'll just pop over to peter to ask that to you Peter, you need to unmute. Great, Peter, we're ready. Oh. Peter, did you want to ask, um, ask the questions or would you like me to read them out for you? I'll, I'll just go ahead. Um, so Peter's asked James, what currently inspires your artwork? Is the first... um, no inspiration really. Um, like most artists, you know, you, inspiration comes very rarely. I always just take a very pragmatic approach, you know, um, and as you get older, you know, pragmatism really becomes a greater priority than inspiration. Um, you know, uh, in my situation, I've only got hours spare, so there's no time for um, procrastination or um, questioning, <laughs> much questioning. It's just get down to business. Let's just make something and see what happens. Okay, and Peter had a couple of follow-up questions to that. Um, the next one is, where do you think that this might take your artwork? Um, that's and a broad question. Ask, just for a second, um, maybe we could ask, um, the third question, which really kind of gets to the heart of it. And yep. that is, does your curatorial work at Deakin influence your personal work? Well, yeah, I mean, how can anything not? Um, um, yeah, I mean, I can't think of um, exact, um, exact, um, I'm just starting to look at the chat, which I'm glad I haven't looked at um, so far, but, um, yeah, um, I, I yeah can't not, but I can't think of exact examples where this plus this equals this in my own work. Um, yeah, I mean it's good to have you know greater differing perspectives. Um, you know, I've been working now on lots of different sites. You know, working with artists as well as being an artist, working with artists in lots of different ways in a professional capacity, and that's allowed me to see, I think intergenerationally too, like just seeing artists towards the end of their career um, and working with the artists at that point in their lives, you know, thinking about their own pasts, um, thinking about their legacy, providing a context to artists that are no longer in fashion. And um, so, yeah, that's provided a lot of, um, you know, a lot of great insight and experiences. Mm. that I wouldn't have had else, else, you know, in other situations. Well, James, that brings us to the end. And really, 
once again, thank you so much for, um, you know, taking the trouble to join us here um, in Art Forum, the Zoom sessions. And um, really to everybody who's participated in this Zoom, thank you so much. Uh, we will see you next week, 12.30, same time, same channel. We'll find you, um, you'll get all the information on the Margaret Lawrence Gallery website. Okay, thanks everybody. Bye-bye now. Thanks, David. Bye.